confirming location. This is the most important section of this entire presentation. Anybody can put a needle into a patient. The important thing is to get it in the right place and to do it carefully and safely and most critically to know that you're in the right place, which can be very challenging. If you insert a needle in and discover you're in the right ventricle, pull back, you will do very little harm in almost all cases. If you insert a drain and then realize that you're in the wrong spot, then that is going to potentially cause a great deal of bother. So this is by far the most important section. And it's critical to have multiple different options at your disposable to confirm the location. Never rely on one method, because if you rely on one method, there will be cases where that method is not helpful and you'll be left not certain that you're in the right spot. What are our options? Well, first, we should aspirate 40 mils of fluid when we first insert the needle before we insert the wire. And this will help to relieve tamponade physiology in the acutely unwell patient. But it will also give us a sample so that if it is straw colored and typical of pericardial fluid, or if it's a malignant hemorrhagic pericardial effusion, we can see if it clots. Obviously, if it's a traumatic pericardial effusion, that may not be helpful. Once we've aspirated the 40 mils, we can insert the wire and then we have a stable situation where we can take our time about our next step, providing the patient is hemodynamically stable. If you aspirate 40 mils of fluid from the right ventricle in a patient with tamponade physiology, it's likely that they will suddenly deteriorate. Fairly rapidly, the right ventricle will refill, so the deterioration may be brief, but immediately ask the patient how they are after aspirating that 40 mils. It can be too quick for the blood pressure to really give you an indication that you've made their hemodynamic situation worse, but it, it will be profound, the response, if you aspirate uh, blood from the right ventricle in somebody with tamponade. I would urge you if you don't do it as a regular part of your practice to consider using ECG guidance. It takes seconds to set up and you then get a constant trace telling you if the needle is in the heart muscle or if it's pericardial. So I would say ECG is underused and very helpful and free information if you're in the cath labs. Radiographic images that tell us that the wire must be pericardial and the, obviously we store images of the drain in place at the end. Radiographic uh, images are probably the most useful and most re reliable way that everybody uses to assess location and that should always be part of your assessment. Echo where we don't have radiographic visualization can be very helpful. We can even visualize the needle entering the pericardium. Um, I would say that's a two operator technique. I don't think you can both control the needle and an ultrasound probe at the same time, but uh, you may have those skills. I have done it under echo guidance with an anesthetist on ITU um, using the echo probe to visualize my needle the needle tip and I found that very helpful. Uh, generally, I would say subcostal approach is more favorable for trying to use echo to guide you. You can also ultrasound uh, after you've drained a few hundred mils to see that you are reducing the volume of the pericardial fluid. If you need to inject contrast, you can do it via the needle, but it can be hard to keep the needle steady. And it's a reasonable option to use the dilator from a four French sheath, which has a very similar diameter to the needle itself. So it doesn't really significantly increase the size of the, uh, the perforation. And once you've got your dilator in place, it's in a much more stable situation. Um, so via the needle, if you're confident that you can, can hold it steady and you've got plenty of echo separation, buy a dilator, four French dilator, um, there has to be a four French, no bigger than that. And you can inject contrast, both uh, X-ray contrast or bubble contrast. And you can also look at hemodynamic monitoring 
if you wanted to, to decide if you're in the pericardium. ECG monitoring is one of the most underused ways of assessing your needle location. Remember that until you actually touch the skin, your needle won't be making a circuit. The needle is one of the poles in the bipolar ECG system. And if you're not attached, you won't see anything. Normally speaking, it depends the angle that you're approaching the heart from, but uh, you might see something much like lead two. This is an example from putting in a pacemaker because it's exactly the same system. We take one of the chest leads that would be attached to Wilson Central Terminal one end, maybe V6, V5, and we attach the lead that would be attached to the chest to the needle tip. And in pacing, we put a crocodile clip on the end of the pacemaker. Now we're deliberately trying to deploy a screw on the tip of a uh, active fixation pacemaker lead into the heart muscle. So we're looking for this ST elevation here. And that's what you get if you insert the needle into the heart muscle. So we're hoping, and you will see, you should, once you put the first insert the needle into the skin, the moment you touch the skin, you'll start getting your signal. Get, let it settle down, look at it, fix in your mind what it should look like and then look for any signs of ST elevation developing. And this is a real time measure. It updates instantly um, or as frequently as the heart is beating. And it is a very useful measure. Should never rely on one thing alone, but it's a very useful measure. So just to show you another example, this is something I've got off the internet. So we have our crocodile clip attached to the metal part of the needle. It then goes off to, uh, to attach the ECG amplifier and it's effectively Wilson Central Terminal that it attaches up to. Don't worry about what that is. The uh, cardiac technician will know what that is and you uh, perhaps remember it from basic ECG days. Um, so our needle, if it's in the pericardium or if it's in the skin anywhere, so it's touching the patient, will show us a fairly standard type ECG appearance, but particularly without ST elevation. If we touch the heart, we will immediately see marked ST elevation. So it's a very useful, very simple way of uh, getting extra information about where you are. Should you touch the heart and see ST elevation, you know that you've passed through the pericardium to get there. So it simply withdraw slowly until the ST elevation resolves. If you can aspirate fluid at that point, you're in the pericardium. X-rays are probably the most useful and most widely used technique, but beware if you're ever having to do an emergency pericardiocentesis on the ward and all you have is echo guidance, if all you can rely on to know you're in the right place is an X-ray. And you have to always be preparing for the challenging episode. So is this wire pericardial? What we're looking for is a wire that couldn't anatomically be anywhere else. And I'm sure that you're immediately noticing that this wire is going up to the apex of the lung and down again. And this uh, was put in by one of my registrars who did the procedure very nicely, apically, got some straw coloured fluid out and inserted the wire. And then immediately we realised that we were about to put in a pleural drain rather than a pericardial drain. So we simply withdrew and approached again and this time got into the pericardium. This is what we're looking for. This wire is wrapping around the outside of the heart. The only place this could be is inside the pericardium. It couldn't possibly be inside a cardiac chamber. Sometimes the wire just, no matter how you manipulate it, doesn't want to play ball. It doesn't want to wrap around the heart. And this is an example of one where we were pretty sure that this is pericardial, but maybe there were some adhesions for one reason or another. We couldn't feel that we were adequately certain. So injecting some x-ray contrast through a four French 
dilator, we can see that this fluid, this contrast, is pericardial. And if we wait a moment and screen again, you can see that the contrast remains in this area that was the only place we seem to be able to deploy the wire. So this would have been a loculated pericardial effusion. And the fact that the contrast is staying put tells us that it's pericardial. This is an example using echo contrast. So the pericardial fluid, rather than being black, uh, is now filled with tiny little bubbles which can be seen to move around. Uh, I find using uh, a colloid solution like Volplex creates very, very good bubbles with uh, half a mil of air. Um, if you can't get hold of a colloid solution, uh, then a little bit of blood and saline with a little bit of air will do nicely. Uh, get somebody else to create the bubble contrast for you. Don't try and do it yourself. And you can either inject it through the needle or through a four French uh, dilator. Um, this is extremely helpful if you don't have access to um, X-rays. I don't do it routinely when I'm doing a pericardial synthesis in the lab because I really don't use it very often. But as I say, if you put a four French dilator in, your position is secure and then you have all the time you need to create your bubble contrast solution and confirm location before you put the drain in. We also talked earlier about using echo to actually visualize the needle and guide your insertion of the needle and this is an example of an, a needle visualized with echo. Um, if you've got an extra pair of hands or you possess the skills to do that while having very good control of the needle then that becomes an option for you. I personally think that you're best to control the needle with both hands um, making it very difficult to also hold an echocardiogram probe.